You know, I'm gonna give you a history lesson. We got some dumbass motherfuckers floating around this country. <laughs> Stop laughing! <laughs> and when I do, Start fucking. Also, y'all did some nasty ass jokes on my ass, too. Funny jokes and unfunny jokes come out of the same birth. You fucking guys are unbelievable. Why are you laughing? Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Why Are You Laughing, a history of comedy podcast. And today, I am pleased to introduce to you a Mr. Artie Lang. That's right. One of the, uh, one of my favorites, really. One of my favorite characters in the world of radio and stand up throughout the years and he's kind of uh disappeared lately um so we'll get into it and i would just recommend everyone buckle up because this could be one of our longer ones um i've got a ton of clips prepared and i still feel like i'm missing a bunch of stuff so uh if you guys want to hear if you get to the end of the episode and feel like you still want to hear an Artie lang part two then let me know and maybe we'll do it on the patreon eventually and if you're wondering, Mike, where can I find the Patreon? Uh, well, that's easy. Just go to blindmike.net. That's where you can find the Patreon, subscribe, get bonus episodes. Um, we've had a bunch up there recently. Uh, Bill Burr's Philly Rant, Donald Glover's Weirdo, Tucker Max, which we did with my buddy Carl from WATP. The world's biggest uh, Tucker Max fan. The world, yes. That's the fun thing is we found different angles. We found the world's biggest Tucker Max fan in Carl. <laughs> Um, who was reading his blogs with his feeties up, kicking them in the air. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we found the Pablo Francisco drinking game. So we've we've put some twists on these uh, uh, bonus episodes. So. I, I highly enjoy Carl being like, oh, I'm not a big that big a Tucker Max guy, but here's the fourth book of his I own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, going, he's got a shelf of, of literature that's all written by Tucker Max. <laughs> uh, so check out those bonus episodes. Go to blindmike.net if you want to subscribe to the Patreon. Um, or a simpler, cheaper way to support the show would be on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, uh, wherever you get podcasts. And you can also find the links to Blind Mike Project and WATS, the free links for those shows as well. Um, and those are also at blindmike.net. So basically what I'm saying is go support the show. We hit 2,000 subscribers on YouTube finally which, uh, you know, it's not a big number, but we're getting there. The army is building, folks, so make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Please, please come say hi. So today, as I mentioned, we are talking about the great Artie Lang, who, um, you know, I, he obviously had a good stand-up career, made a lot of money in stand-up. Uh, I think of him, as I'm sure a lot of people do, as one of the great personalities in radio history and probably doesn't get enough credit for being as good a broadcaster as he is mm. uh, because people know him more for his you know personality and all the baggage that goes along with that but I think even when he hosted a show on his own like away from Stern um, I think he was very good and I think all the way up to Artie Lang's halfway house the first version of that um, I think he was still uh, very good now there are reasons uh, things started to fail which we'll get into but I think Artie is a fascinating character. I hope he's doing okay now, but I just wanted to take this time because I know a lot of people that listen are like Stern and Opie and Anthony and just radio in general fans. Um, so I feel like a lot of people like Artie Lang. So like I said, if you get to the end of the episode and want a part two, let me know because we're barely scratching the surface with this guy. Um, but we're going to start in his childhood, in his, his early years, because I think this is something that uh, shaped um, kind of his personality and probably has a lot to do with some of his issues. Um, but, uh, this is a story about his father, uh, when Artie was a, a pretty young man. Hey Artie, someone was telling me your dad fell off a roof and became a paraplegic? Quadriplegic. You know? Wow. Yeah, when uh, he installed TV antennas for a living, you know, he climbed roofs. And, uh, <laughs> nice job. Yeah, I was going to well, say, this is how he hurt himself? No, what happened? Well, you grew up so rich, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, in Jersey, Jeez. man. There <laughs> wasn't much he could do. Uh, no, well, he, he made an all right living. I mean, he grew up with nothing. And, right. I mean, he dropped out of high school and stuff. But, you know, he worked hard, and he, he, we got a house and everything. And, right. And he did well in the 70s because everybody needed an antenna. Right. And people were afraid to climb roofs, and he was like crazy on a roof and uh then a week after my 18th birthday he was working 
He had this ladder. He put it on top of a picnic table to reach the roof. Oy vey. He could, and he did it a lot. I used to work with him. He was just nuts. And right. to bust my chops, he would, like, screw around. He fell off the ladder oh. onto his head. And at feet. first you thought he was joking with you. And no, no, I wasn't there. I mean, but... Uh, because he couldn't reach the roof. He, he dived right on his head. Dived right on his head, 30 feet, and he thought <sighs> he was dead, but he ended up being a quadriplegic. Mm. And the thing was, usually in that case... Your some, dad's still alive? No, he died four right. years later, which right. was... Because he was just tortured, you know? Yeah. But... Um, so, obviously, a, a horrible story, and uh, an even more tragic part of that for the family is that a bunch of lawyers contacted them afterwards, um, you know, trying to uh, make a few bucks off of this situation. And usually what lawyers do in that case is go attack the ladder company, I guess, is usually who they sue in a situation like that. Um, but it turned out that Artie's dad, uh, the apple doesn't far, fall far from the tree because apparently Artie's dad stole the ladder. So there was no, they didn't have a case. <laughs> also, when you once you put it on a picnic table, it's kind of out yeah, of the hands. tough also. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a couple of reasons I find that story interesting. A, um, what's, what I love about doing these episodes, whether it's, uh, O&A or Stern related is there's just so much, so much of their lives, like for Artie Lang, so much of his life is just broadcast. It's out. It's literally, you can just do a YouTube search. Whereas, like with Lucio Ball, I'm Google. I'm going through Dick Cavett interviews, praying she mentioned uh, communism on there at some point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but like with Artie, everything, everything he's just talked about everything on radio, and there's a rabid enough fan base that everyone, you know, just puts puts this stuff on YouTube. Um, but uh, the stuff about his dad. Uh, is really sad for obvious reasons. Anyone just falling off a ladder and becoming a quadriplegic is very sad. Mm. But uh, where I say that, you know, applying it to Artie is that a lot of people say the the trauma there, and I mean, even Artie has uh, talked about this a little bit, um, but the trauma there led to a lot of his uh, drug use. And also people saying that... Um, uh, already blaming himself for not being there. Cause I think you even heard him say in that clip that he would work with his dad sometimes on um, things like that. So in Artie's mind, like, Hey, I would have been there to hold the ladder. And if I was, then my dad would still be walking around. It'd still be fine. Right. Um, now that's obviously silly to blame yourself like that, but that is what people do a lot in those situations. And, you know, I do think that probably contributed to him going down this wormhole of trying to mask some of that with drugs. It's certainly not the only factor, but, uh, definitely played a big, big part in it. For sure. Do you know how old his dad was when he died? Did it say, <sighs> um, I think he might have, he may have mentioned it later in that clip, but he, I mean, a, a younger man already was yeah. only uh, late teens. I think when that happened, right? Yeah, that sucks. Um, yeah, and, and put it this way: I don't know the age difference of his parents. His mother is still alive, which is pretty crazy. Right? <laughs> she's. I think, <laughs> I think. I think. Um, Artie may be living with his mother right now. So yeah, she's she's still alive and well, apparently, which is good. But she's gonna outlive him too. Well, we keep saying that, but that's true. Norm off the list. Gilbert's gone. Saget. Yeah, that's he's true. He's out doing them all. Yeah, he, 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 him, he'll survive like the nuclear explosion with the cockroaches and Twinkies. He'll yeah. be Artie Lang. <laughs> uh, all right. So what's, um, what's next? Uh, we have uh, his first appearance on Stern. Yeah. So this is, uh, it kind of combines two things. It's the first time he was ever on the Howard Stern show and shout out to Norm who knows what Artie's life would have been like. This is what's so interesting about moments like this. Literally who knows what Artie's career and life would have been if Norm didn't do this. Uh, This is when we, you know, one of our first episodes was Norm getting fired from Saturday night live Um, right around that time when Norm was doing these appearances on Letterman and Stern telling the story constantly um, this is one of those instances and he was making dirty work and Artie Lang happened to be with him that day. 
I brought, I brought my friends Lojo and Frank Sebastiano and uh, Artie Lang, my buddy that I did this movie with. Is that the guy who got fired from Mad TV? Yeah, man, he got fired from Mad TV. Yeah. This is the coolest story. What did he? Where is he? <laughs> Bring him in too. He's a good guy, man. Bring, come on in here. Funniest story. What's this guy's name? Uh, uh, Artie. Artie. I like how that's Norm being a terrific friend. Yeah. Being like, I'm going on this show. I'm going to shoehorn your name in here to get you into on the program. Yeah, yeah, that's a tremendous friend. And what's great about Norm, and the reason I love Norm, is that it almost sounds like he's fucking with him or fucking with Howard or something. Yeah. Where he's like, ah, oh, it's the coolest story. It almost sounds like he's doing a Norm impression. <laughs> it's so cool. <laughs> but yeah, that's him being a great friend. And like I said, if Norm doesn't do that, if he just says, ah, yeah, a couple of my friends are outside. Who knows? I mean, Artie, maybe he has a career in stand-up. The one thing about I will say about Artie Lang is that uh, he's the only person, and I mean of people that worked there, like Gilbert obviously had his own career and everything like that. Um, oh, you know what? I take that back because I'm thinking now Billy West also uh, stood up on his own. Billy West and Artie Lang would be the two guys that really like paved their own way outside of the Stern show. Mm. Um, now, you can also argue maybe Artie Lang never would make been making eight hundred grand a night uh, doing you know, theaters for, for stand up if it wasn't for the Stern Show. But like he did have he got acting roles and th- he was on Norm's show and Mad TV without Howard. Uh, after Howard, he was on Crashing and things like that. So uh, yeah, he had his own success outside of the show. But uh, not only is this his first appearance on Stern, he's also telling stories about um, his only, you know, real prior success, which was uh, Mad TV. Now, we talked about um, the early day when we talked about Chevy Chase, we talked about what a success the first season of Saturday Night Live was and that first cast. Uh, it wasn't the same with Mad TV. <laughs> it seems like, I mean, Mad TV at, at no point was a massive success. But even to the, the fans of Mad TV, when you think back on it, you're never thinking of season one, the, the time that Artie was there. Yeah, uh, Artie, Bobby Lee, Brian Callen, Will Sasso, heavy hitters. Yeah, yeah, they did They did have some big names. <laughs> but this is Artie telling uh, a story of basically how he got fired from Mad TV. Fight. Yeah, so they go to the Tyson fight, right? right. Then this dude, Artie. you know, already bets like more money than he has. Like How much did you bet? I bet like uh, fifteen thousand dollars. Okay, right. So then, of course, Tyson loses. But then, <laughs> so then he goes crazy. Doesn't know what to do. He's trying to get his money back. So he goes to the casino, loses a bunch of money in the casino. How much did you lose in the casino? <laughs> like another five grand. Okay, like like sent you on a tear. Huh? Yeah, he just went into a spiral. Then uh, he does a bunch of coke and beats up his manager. Oh, like, really? And gets thrown in jail. <laughs> really? And then when he gets thrown in jail, some dude. Uh, how come fat guys are all doing coke and they're still fat? I thought you get yeah, thin from doing coke. Well, actually, I've, I haven't done coke in like eight months. What, you go to rehab? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah? What, do you just hang around with like Chris Farley and this guy? I mean, it's like all <laughs> fat guys that do coke? Really Why, good, weren't I we going to call Don Omar? Wasn't that going to happen? <laughs> that was the idea. <laughs> so then yeah. he gets fired from the show. Right. He doesn't have any money. And because he did the gambling yeah. and he got he got Thrown arrested. in jail. For beating up that guy. Yeah. Yeah. So then he has to go back. To I didn't beat anybody up. Oh, okay. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so then he has to go back to New Jersey and right. become a cab driver. Is that right? <laughs> 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 so Norm Norm's obviously uh, telling a fun version of the story and you can tell Artie's like super nervous there and it's funny we got a couple more clips from this interview um, going a little more in depth into the story but uh, the, the clips I took from were from I assume the E! show yeah and they would you know do a little like behind the scenes interviews with the guys and stuff like that and one of the cameras goes up to Artie after the show and they uh, they say, hey, Artie, how'd it go? And he goes, yeah, he's fucking around. But he goes, yeah, I want to thank Norm for ruining my life, basically. <laughs> so you can kind of hear in this moment, Artie's like, ah, fuck. Like, he's nervous to tell this story about him being a degenerate. Yeah. And it's funny that th- this is what his career was built on, basically. <laughs> I know. <laughs> the other crazy thing, by the way, just in general, is like when I see, you know, you'll see on Twitter, like Dave Portnoy just, you know, uh, casually, I'm betting, you know, 15, 20, 50 grand on something. But he has a shit ton of money. 
You know, right. like Mad TV was a network show, but it was on Saturday nights like or Friday nights, whatever it was. Yeah, It was not a success yet. The Artie Lang should not be betting 15 grand on it by any means. Well, he's, he's going, if this hits, my life will change. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, and by the way, Norma, huge degenerate gambler as well. Humongous. And you'll hear him, you'll, you'll hear Norm in this interview if you go and listen. Be like, uh, yeah, Artie still gambles a lot. I, I, I kicked the hep. And like, <laughs> n- now we know Artie and Norm never did, but not once. Um, all right, there's a little more here. I, I love hated, out of control. I hated LA. I mean, the, Man TV treated me really well. They were nice. They to were me. good to you, Quincy they Jones. They gave me a break. Quincy Jones, like the best guy in the world. Okay, but I had a lot of problems. Right, and I was like really depressed. Down. What were LA. your problems? Well, you yeah. gambled, what, what and you problem? were on coke. Gambling, a lot of booze, and coke, and coke. Yeah, right. right. Every once in a while, like I said, like once a month, I, like I would say, oh, I'm gonna do cocaine, and I just would, get, and it would end up bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it never ended up good. Right. And the last time it ended up bad <laughs> yeah. was in front. <laughs> Of Quincy front. Jones. I yeah. can handle it. No, right. but I was I was in front of uh I got arrested at like eleven o'clock in the morning. I was up for like three days. And, right. Uh in front of the studio where we shot the show for possession yeah. of coke. Right. So who, who <laughs> caught you with the coke? Got, when he goes to jail, right? Yeah. Because you know how they rape you? Yeah. You got <laughs> raped? No, you didn't get, <laughs> get raped. You didn't get raped, but they, they like they put a special thing on you. Like if you're either a snitch or a celebrity. Right. They put this in LA County jail, they put the, a red band on you, and that means one of three things. Either you're a celebrity, you're a snitch, or you're a murderer. So that wow. means they separate you. <laughs> From the other, wow. The other so, they so now they're playing a game so, trying to figure out what you are. Yeah, well, so no they one figure. knows me. Right. <laughs> yeah, so you're either a snitch or a murderer. Show. Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, you, what, what's great about that clip, I think, first of all, it starts with Howard. You can barely even hear it, but Howard says, uh, I love out of control guys. You can hear the genius that was Howard Stern, his wheels turning, being like, oh, this guy's a disaster. I could do a lot with him. Oh, you can see how excited he was to talk to him. And well, he, well, even um, he references Don Olmeyer there. The, Don Olmeyer's the guy that got Norm fired, essentially. Uh, and they kept saying, we're going to call Don Olmeyer and uh, confront him on Norm's behalf. Yeah. Um, and then later, Artie keeps saying, like, weren't we supposed to call uh, Don Olmeyer? And Howard goes, who cares about Don Olmeyer? Oh, You're way more interesting. Right. And it's just a cool moment because you hear Howard like, oh, this is, I like this guy. You know, he finds it interesting. Yeah, there's no way their relationship's going to end bad is what you're thinking. No, no chance. They'll be friends forever. Yeah. <laughs> Two buds. <laughs> um, but the other thing too is like good for Norm, I mean good for uh, Artie rather, for jumping in and kind of taking control of that story. Because he's looking at it like, oh, Norm's... Uh, not given all the details, I got to jump in here. Whereas I, I would probably be, my confidence level would have me saying, oh, I'm on my idols show. Like already grew up listening to Howard Stern. He said, it's one of the things him and his dad bonded over. Mm-hmm. Um, d- talking to my idol and my good friend who's given me a career, like Norm put him on his TV show and in dirty work. I'm not going to interrupt either of these guys. To Norm, say whatever you want about me. Right, <laughs> you know? right. Take this story wherever you'd like. I'm not saying a word. I'd be too scared. So good for Artie for having the presence of mind to be like, all right, let me jump in here and kind of take control. Um, next, we have him talking about his uh, Mad TV pig story. Yeah, so I, just, I uh, like I said, we have a shit ton of clips, and yet I still feel like we're not covering everything we need to get to with Artie. Um, because one of Artie's great qualities is I think he's one of the best storytellers ever. That's what made him so great on radio. Right. But these stories, he's very, um, a long winded is the wrong word. Cause it seems like I'm insulting him, but he's very detailed. He really gets in depth in a lot of these stories. Mm-hmm. So I just took, you know, three clips of a nine minute story, but there's a lot more to this. It goes like longer beyond where I even clipped it. Um, just for, you know, the sake of doing less than a three hour podcast. Yeah. But, um, I, if you haven't heard the full story before, I recommend it. It's like a 10 minute story he tells. Um, but this is just a little bit of it. It was a bad time in my life. I was doing a lot of drugs, a lot of Coke. I was, you know, strung out all this stuff. We do this sketch called Babe Watch. 
My call time is 4 a.m. We're shooting it on location in Malibu, way out in Malibu. So they get us a little motel to stay at while we're out there. Right. I get there 4 a.m. They put three hours of pig prosthetics on me. <laughs> pig snout, six teats that are each going to have a bikini top. Uh, Ears. Everything. <laughs> I look like a disgusting pig. And like I'm way too much effort going and into I'm, it. Right. I'm like the David Hasselhoff. I'm the, the, the lifeguard. Right. And the, the, the makeup was amazing because I looked like a pig. Right. <laughs> Um, so he, you know, he, uh, he goes about town because this is Artie's, uh, Artie will tell you. And I think he even heard in one of the clips we've already played where he's like, yeah, yeah, I had a problem. He'd talk about his problem, like in the past tense Mm -hmm. and be like, but now I'm good. And then like a year later, you'd hear Artie talking and he'd be like, yeah, you know, there were times like where I said I was good and I was high on Coke then. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that, I mean that's the case with a lot of drug addicts. But right. um, so this is you know one of the times where Artie was going through a a rough spell, and he was on the set, and he's fucking jonesing for a little uh, booger sugar, and that's where we keep uh, picking up here. <laughs> listen, listen. To so I go. He there's uh, right on the Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu. There's this little restaurant. There's a parking lot. Right. He goes. Can you get there? I go. And without question, I need the coke. Otherwise, I'll I'm gonna drown myself in the Pacific Coast. Right. <laughs> you know, so now I'm the star of this sketch. I'm the lead. Right. So. It's it's the the assistant director's job to make sure they wrangle the cast, but it takes so long to light stuff. During a lighting thing, I snuck to my car in the full pig outfit, the teeth, <laughs> get in the car, and just speed away. So now I notice the assistant director see me like, Oi, where you going? But there's a pig head in the window. I'm a pig. I look like a pig. If you were next to me in the car, you'd say that's a pig drive. Right. <laughs> so I, I I do like 90 to this restaurant. Now I'm waiting in the parking lot for this dealer. It was this Rastafarian guy. <laughs> And um, uh, I'm sitting there all antsy. He finally shows up. It was like seeing Jesus Christ. Right. Uh, I didn't have any cash on me, so, of course, you know, being the nice drug dealer that he was, he put it on my account. Right. Can you do that? I mean, I'm on a TV show. He knows I'm good for it. Right. And uh, at the time, I was a good customer. He gives me... <laughs> at the time. <laughs> so, again, I recommend, if you haven't heard the story before, go in and listen to it, because he gets into detail about exactly, first of all, how great the prosthetics were, where he looked exactly like a pig. And he talks about the, the you know, mental anguish, the toll taken on him, because every once in a while he'd see himself in the mirror. And not not liter not 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 uh, figuratively is he like, oh, I'm such a pig. He's literally looking at himself doing coke or eating in a pig outfit where he looks exactly like a pig. I just popped it on the screen <laughs> just so people can see it. If you're watching along with us. Yeah. Go to uh, YouTube folks. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, I, I believe to me the funniest aspect of the story. So now I get a little high and I'm feeling better. So now I, I decide that I'm going to just sit in a restaurant and like order something, you know, like a water and a coffee. Huh. So I sit in a restaurant. I order food, full pig out, just the whole thing. Are people staring at I get, a, I, get a, I get a cup of coffee and I say I'm an actor working on some. You know, L.A., they bought it. Right. So now, man, see, I need more blow. So I go back to the car and do another blast of coke. I say, now nah, I got to go back to the set. So... I get to I, I get yeah, to, remember the yes, shoot. I get to, <laughs> yeah, I get. To, I've got an hour. Right. right? Oh, they must have wanted now, to kill you. I get you. to a red light. I make a left. I go up the Pacific Coast Highway. Now, I, I hit a little traffic at a light because I was about twenty minutes up the highway. Right. At a light, I decide I need another. I need another hit. <laughs> so I do like a. I do like a key hit. They used to call you. Put a little bit on the end of a key. Right. right. So I put a little bit on the end of a key. <laughs> With your pigs down. I'm still, I look over, there's a woman in a Lamborghini. <laughs> like, I just, she looked over and she wasn't done. She was on an asshole trip. She goes, that's a pig doing go Kenny. <laughs> you just see a human pig doing blow off of a key in traffic. <laughs> Oh, that would have been the funniest like thing said, to see. <laughs> that's only halfway through that story. It just happens to be my favorite part, but go back and listen if you'd like. Now, the sad reality, if you want to put a, uh, you know, shine a light on that story, is any podcast uh, or radio show you've ever listened to where, like, Artie's not there, he's late, or he didn't show up. If you've ever gone to a show, uh, like a stand-up show that's been delayed, the sad reality is that's what's Art, what Artie is doing in those moments. Right. Is 
just desperately searching for drugs wherever he can find them. So like, and you know, and this is what comedy is really so good for Artie to be able to doing to, to um, uh, for being able to do something with it. But he really took a lot of his, uh, his vices and his pain and his addictions and turned them into uh, a masterful career of storytelling. Yes, he did. I, <laughs> Just the idea, because it it looks like if a pig turned into a human is exactly what he looked like. Right. What's hilarious to me about stories like that is there's a woman with a story that has no ending. I know. There's just a lady (laughs) who drives a Lamborghini out there like, no, I'm telling you, he was a pig and he was snorting something. I assume drugs. I don't know. Or she watches. I don't know what pigs do. Yeah, there's, there's a chance she watches Mad TV, and she goes, "That's the guy." <laughs> I told you. <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right, uh, where are we going now? Uh, him talking about dirty work. Uh, I think Letterman. Oh yeah. So this is. Um, I just wanted to include some aspect of uh, the dirty work thing, and I figured um, might as well go with a story. Uh, f- about one of Artie's clear influences and clear idols. Um, you know, he obviously idolized Stern. If you were a listener, you heard that a lot. But you can also hear a lot of uh, rickles in Artie's, just the way Artie talks and tells stories, even all the way down to the, uh, uh, I don't know if it's in this clip, but um, in this Letterman appearance, he has a kind of a throwaway line and then goes, anyway, which is a rickles thing. <laughs> First day of shooting, we have to work with the great Don Rickles. Tremendous. Okay. Just tremendous. Now, that's good and bad. I'm happy to meet him, but I'm afraid I'm just going to bust out laughing because Don Rickles, coincidentally enough, plays a guy who insults me and Norm. (laughs) 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 He's typecasting. And uh, they give Don a bunch of lines to learn, and that's a mistake. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a master at it. So finally, he couldn't really remember the lines. They say, Don, look, look at Norm and Artie, look at these two schlubs, and just insult them (laughs) off the top of your head. (laughs) So this is the first shot of the movie, and I got Don Rickles about to insult me. (laughs) Uh, So, uh, well, let's hear it. The, uh, The Rickles line? Said Marty, Bob Saget's directing a film. The man grabbed his chest. (laughs) 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 So that was good for Saget's confidence. (laughs) So the first shot is a three shot, me, Norm, and Rickles. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying not to laugh. We play these idiot theater guys. We work in a movie theater. And Rickles is our boss. So they yell action. Rickles comes up to me. I have no idea what he's going to say. He gets this far from my face, and he goes, look at you. Look at you, you baby gorilla. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, all the lines, there's the, uh, already talks about a couple more lines that he has. All the lines are in the movie, Dirty Work, if you go watch that scene. And what's beautiful about that scene is like, there's virtually no reason for it. None. He's (laughs) like, yeah. I guess it shows that these guys have like dead end jobs or whatever, but it's really all the scene is doing is saying, Hey, how do we get Don Rickles into this? Movie? <laughs> Toy story. Got him. How can we? And he says, uh, you know, I think one of the lines is uh, uh, Baskin Robbins called, uh, you ate them down to only seven flavors. <laughs> <laughs> he, he leans into Artie's belly and just says, are you having fun in there and ice cream dancing around? <laughs> it's, just, it's nonsense. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. But, but, um, uh, yeah, our, uh, Don Rickles being in that movie is, uh, is beautiful. And then he moves on to, uh, to harassing Norm after that. He gets to that and then he gets to Norm. He has to insult Norm now. <laughs> Norm, by the way, never didn't laugh. If you rent the movie Dirty Work, Norm is laughing in the scene. (laughs) He's not a great actor like me, Norway. (laughs) We weren't exactly Newman and Redford, you know. So uh, then he gets, Rickles gets to Norm, he's laughing, so they had to write him a line. He goes, what are you laughing at? Because I called your friend the fat pig. (laughs) (laughs) And then Norm goes, no, I was just laughing when you were talking to his belly. So while we're filming in the movie, he goes to Norm, he goes, how did you get a movie? (laughs) (laughs) And Saget goes, Saget being a brilliant director, goes, cut. 
Don, you can't insult them as Norm Macdonald. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to work. You know, he's, we can't put it in the film. His, his name is Mitch in the film. Insult Mitch. So Rickles goes, all right. And the next thing he goes, he goes, look at you. He goes, he goes, who wrote this script? These jokes are horrible. <laughs> God, Don, don't insult the script. <laughs> we can't use it. So anyway, it was 18 hours of that. At the end of the day, I went up to him. I said, Mr. Rickles, it was a pleasure working with you. And uh, he looked at me and he said, listen, I was watching you all day. And listen, let me tell you something. Good luck working construction. <laughs> 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 I think my favorite line in there is already saying, and Bob Saget being a brilliant director had the sense to say, you can't insult him as Norm McDonald. <laughs> you can't break the fourth wall. <laughs> yeah, as if no one would have picked up on that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Dirty Work is obviously, you know, we've talked about it before, a cult classic for sure. And at the end of Norm's life, I don't know how they would have done this. And I also don't know if it was just something to kind of occupy. If Norm did it as like, I kind of want to just occupy my time and work with my friends or how serious an endeavor it was. Yeah. Um, but the sag it's at the end of both of their lives, I guess I didn't even really realize that until I'm saying it now. Um, but at the end of Norm's life, he and Saget were working on a sequel to dirty work. I know. Uh, I think the only way that works is if this time Artie is sick because we'll get more into it, but like, he's not the same Artie now. Right. Um, he's done a couple podcasts in the last few years when Norm died, he put out, um, a short episode and like, he's just, there, there's it, that guy that you see there on Letterman's couch. Like that guy is gone. There's well, something the 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 joy in Artie seems to be gone. Like his storytelling ability and um, his wit and his timing. I, I don't know if that's there anymore in the little that I've heard of. Well, in the next uh, clip, you'll see the drastic difference. Um, well, one. So let me just say that uh, uh, the the other thing that I wanted to uh, talk about was Dirty Work is certainly a movie that. Uh, People think it was a cult classic that already was involved in. And the other one is uh, Beer League. Did you ever see that? Beer League is one of my favorite movies. It's one of the oh, only really? it's one of the only DVDs I still have. It's funny. People either say that and they say they love it, or they're like, oh, it's a complete piece of shit. <laughs> oh. uh, and I think I think it's just based on how willing, like how much you like just completely silly frat humor oh, type yeah. comedies. There, you there's, know? there's like a party at a bar and there's a stripper named Pitching Machine who shoots ping pong balls out of her box. <laughs> it's the best movie. And Nick DiPaolo is a crooked cop who does blow. It's awesome. <laughs> what's interesting What's interesting about that uh, movie is that Artie was working on it um, while he was on Stern. And there's a few clips you can go find where like essentially Artie's having a lot of troubles um, for, for various reasons. And part of it was the amount of stress he put on, on himself by, you know, getting up at 5 a.m., 5.30 a.m., whatever, to get into Stern, mm -hmm. um, doing four hours of radio, and then filming a movie all day. Um, yeah. That takes a toll on you, mentally, physically, all of that. Um, but yeah, no, I think... And that, kind of a... Stop. What's that? I was going to say, I think I'm one of the few people that actually prefers Beer, beer League over, uh, over Dirty Work. Oh, yeah, I've never heard anyone say that. Yeah. To, well, maybe, maybe we'll do a viewing of Beer League one day oh, as a Patreon episode. I will love that. There's just like, what, it's like, I don't know what it is, but it's, maybe it's just the way Artie talks. But there's one scene yeah. where he has, <laughs> he has sex in a twin bed next to his mother's bedroom, and she brings him in a breakfast, like breakfast in bed with the girl there. He takes a bite mm -hmm. and he just goes, this Danish is stale. <laughs> and like, it's just <laughs> everything about the scene and the way he delivers it is like the funniest shit to me. Um, well, my favorite thing about him, his, you know, work ethic <laughs> is, um, like I said, he'd be doing that. He'd be filming all day, he'd get, mm -hmm. he'd get into Stern for 6 a.m. And uh, Jim Norton, when Opie and Anthony, when Sirius XM merged, uh, these guys were all in the same building, the Howard Stern show and the Opie and Anthony show. And, um, Norton would always say like, it was hard for me to bitch about my schedule when uh, I would wake up clean and sober 
and stroll into the Sirius XM building and get into the elevator with Artie Lang, who was out doing heroin and cocaine all night. <laughs> We'd get there at the same time. <laughs> But yeah, it's we it's weird. Artie had a tremendous work ethic and was also incredibly lazy at the same time. Yeah. It's a bizarre dichotomy that he was working with. Well, well, I mean, I think the work ethic was I don't think he was lazy, you just nod off due to the heroin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lazy is probably the wrong word. More drug addict is a better description of it. <laughs> I like to go with drug addict. Yeah. <laughs> Um, um, so what were you alluding to? What's our next clip? Uh him it's just post nose collapsing, which we'll get to in a little. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, this is him talking about methadone. Uh, okay. A couple of times I went to a methadone clinic that opened at 6 a.m. Because the guy was a fan of Stern, he would let me come into the methadone clinic at 5.30 and oh. get, I, I took a, a shot, they give it to you an orange juice. Okay, you take a shot of orange juice with the methadone. Twice I threw up on the air. And one time, the, the, again, I was never funnier off the shit than this. Uh, Howard was talking, I think it was Roseanne Barr. And Howard said, hey, you look thin. She was on the phone. <laughs> and I'm nauseous. <laughs> Like, okay, so, so, so the, listen to this timing. I'm nauseous from the methadone. I feel like I'm going to throw up and I got a live mic, you know? Right. And, uh, and, and she goes, uh, yeah, Howard, I've been exercising. And uh, he goes, what have you been doing? She goes, well, I get in a, I get in a, uh, a two piece bathing suit now. As soon as she said that, you hear me go, <laughs> 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 so what's sad there is you uh, the sad thing about Artie in general is that you can laugh at every clip and then if you seriously break it down it's a tragedy I know <laughs> but even just within that he says to Reese talking to Rogan there and he says like you know I was never funnier off the stuff than I was in this moment and that's a thing that I think plagues a lot of uh, drug addicts and alcoholics who find success while they're still indulging is they tell themselves and they convince themselves uh, like, Oh, if I, if I stop drinking, I won't be funny anymore. Oh yeah. Chris Farley was big time that way. Probably the best example. Cause he had it in like three different ways, like either off yeah. the Coke or lost weight. He thought he wouldn't well, be Well, that's funny. the thing with Farley. I'm sure it's true of Artie Lang and Belushi as well at times. Yeah. But uh, with Chris Farley, the famous stories all involve him uh, asking people like, do you think I'm funny? Like, am I funny? Right. You know, like in private moments, it was always, do you think I'm funny? Am I actually funny? Are they just laughing at me because I'm fat? Um, that sort of shit. Which is weird because at the at a time, he was the funniest person on the planet, probably on television. Right. And yeah, and, and you know, Artie, Artie's always compared to Farley and Belushi and like fame wise, he never had that success. Mm -hmm. But like in his cult circles, I think he was held with the same reverence, really. Well, I think he... He just didn't have the following with like the housewives because you got to remember how big Stern was and how quickly he would sell out theaters everywhere. Right. He didn't have the mainstream promotion of an SNL or anything like right. that. Right. But he did have Stern. Right. So it'd be like those kind of people, but same amount. Yeah, but just like, the degenerates. Yeah. Just the people. And that's, again, the hard part of Artie's life is uh, not just him telling himself he needs drugs to be funny, but also... The only places he worked <laughs> were full of degenerates. Correct. The Stern audience, all, you know, I shouldn't say all because um, Stern had a shit ton of people listening to him from all walks of life. But the stereotypical Stern fan is a degenerate. And then uh, at night you go to comedy clubs where they're, you know, people are, they're plying people with liquor. Right. And Artie's famous thing is that that's what he's famous for is, is drugs and alcohol. So there are people who, you know, some well-intentioned, some not, but people that will constantly go up to him and go, hey, Artie, I got an eight ball. You know, you want to come do it with me? Right. Or it'd be, it'd be like, uh, like normal people sometimes get bought a, a drink or something yeah. and hit, they'll bring cocaine. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and again, some had negative intentions. They want to weasel their way into Artie's life or something, mm -hmm. but some were genuinely like, eh, it's fun. We'll get a, we'll get a cool story out of it. Um, you know, ignorant. Sure. But like, well-intentioned. Right. And it's a uh, one drug addict sharing with another. So they're not quite thinking straight. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, so yeah, Artie, uh, the guy struggled. He was never able to overcome those demons. Um, you know, 
it, it, it's in a way hard to feel bad for him. I would, I, I've heard uh, Big J Okerson talk about this a lot. Um, where he's, he goes, you know, there's a lot of sympathy you can have for Artie Lang. Um, but then at a certain point, you have to be like, all right, dude, now you're 50 years old. Right. You know, you'll either get off the stuff or you won't. Right. You know, now it's kind of up to you. There's only so much, there's only so many times where you can get sober and we feel bad for you. Then we find out you were lying. Uh, you know, then you'll, it, it's a, it's a whole vicious cycle with drug addicts. But I think when you get to a certain age, people even start to lose that sympathy for you. Right. Exactly. Uh, next we have him talking about Bob Euchre. Uh, yeah. So again, he's a great storyteller. I think that's evident in all these clips. Uh, I wanted to include at least one story that is, has nothing to do with uh, drugs or anything. And the first one that came to mind for me was this uh, Bob Uecker story where him and Norm visited Bob Uecker in the booth. He had a cough button. You know, you, if you're going to cough, you hit the cough button right. and, and you're not on the air. Sure. So from what I remember, Norm, I mean, not remember this because he's friends with Bob Uecker. But, uh, <laughs> Uecker, Uecker would be announcing the baseball game. Right. And like a fucking jazz musician. It was unbelievable. If he saw a really hot chick in the crowd, he would hit the cough button right. and say something filthy about her. Then go right back to announcing the game. It was like magic. So I believe it. You think that's a high risk thing to be doing. That's like walking the high wire. He would say, so he would say shit like this. He'd go, um, here's a 2-2 pitch to Sosa, ground ball to shortstop. Look at the fucking tits on that whore. Over to first base, two down. <laughs> <laughs> you hit the button that quickly. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so you must have been out of your mind entertained. And now when you listen to him, you're wondering, like, during the space is what he's saying. Howard, th- th- that, that was, that, that's the story I told on Letterman. I cleaned it up. Right, obviously. right, right. And uh, he started using, like, old guy words for the yeah. chicks. Like, he'd go, uh, fly ball to center field. God, I like to get with that trollop. That's the third out. <laughs> <laughs> so so right. the other thing he did, let me tell the one other thing he did, because yeah. this is amazing. Yeah. He sees John Fogarty. Oh, that was what I was going to say. Creedence He's, Clearwater Revival. Let me tell that. Yeah. Uh, all, right, all right, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> so he sees John Fogarty, you know, from Creedence Clearwater Revival. So he's like, hey, man, that's, uh, that fucker's a rock singer. <laughs> he, goes, uh, he goes, but he can get out of the sand trap like nobody's fucking business. I played in a, in a charity tournament with him. <laughs> so we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We know, we know who John Fogarty is. And he goes, uh, <laughs> he goes, at the seventh inning stretch, I'll have the fucker come up and sing for you. <laughs> <laughs> Fogarty's there with his kid, by the way. He's a big cub face. He's there with his eight-year-old son, John right, Fogarty. Right, so right. we're like, no, no, you don't have to do that. Right, you know, don't don't get John Fogarty yeah, to sing Leave him alone. It's all right. We don't want him singing in front of us. So then he gets mad at us. He goes, do you even know who fucking John Fogarty is? <laughs> so we go, yeah, yeah. He did uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival. He goes, yeah, he did all that fucking shit. <laughs> I left a little extra norm in there for all of us. But <laughs> Which is a staple of this program. Of course. Um, so, yeah, like Norm, I mean, I'm sorry, Artie had a, a tremendous amount of stories of, of all varieties. Um and then again, what got, I, this is a roller coaster because I keep going to what's sad about all these clips. I kind of like but, it though. You're like, oh, here, here's good. Here's bad. Yeah. We ebb and flow here. Yeah. <laughs> but what became sad about a lot of this is like, you would hear Artie start to repeat a lot of stories. I know. Like big time. And sometimes I've, I've heard, um, I was lucky enough to, to see him. I saw him at the Wilbur and uh, I saw him at Skankfest one year. Mm-hmm. And I think I got like pretty pretty coherent Artie, luckily. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have heard stories of him repeating jokes and stories within the same set. Yeah, I have too. I, I, I saw him. I wonder if I was at the same Wilbur show, but uh, yeah, I, he was sharp, like real sharp. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, you get, and, that, and that's what you started to notice with podcast. But what's also interesting about Artie's storytelling is I noticed a lot of Burt Kreischer, um, you know, he may have influenced Burt Kreischer a bit because something people shit all over Burt Kreischer for is like exaggerating or twisting stories to make them more entertaining. Mm-hmm. And my argument has always been like, you know, if it's in the context of, if he's not getting something out of the story being true, other than laughs, who gives a fuck? And I think that's what Artie would do a lot too. Whereas like if you were going to bring him to a court of law and make him prove every detail of the story, maybe it wouldn't hold up. But I think that's kind of the mark of a good storyteller is he almost elevates reality into being a better story than it was. Yeah. But like with, uh, I'd say the difference is with Artie, you know, he's just going for the laugh. 
Right. In Bert, you're like, I think he's trying to sound cool. Or he's something. trying to convince you of yeah. something. Yeah, that's probably why people criticize him. But. That was my guess. Um, um, all right. Where, where are we now with uh, Arthur? Uh, breaking down. Well, yeah, this is where things start to uh, um, get a little more noticeably worse. So Artie was on Howard Stern for, I think he was officially there for like eight and a half years. Um, and what's interesting about his role there, what I've always found interesting, is they call it the Jackie chair. They say Artie took Jackie's job. And that's tr- I don't really look at it that way. While it is true, I think they had incredibly different roles on that show. Mm-hmm. Um, while they were both characters on the show, I think ja- Jackie's primary job was r- as a writer. Right. Is my basic understanding. Now, again, I'm not old enough to have been a listener during that time. Um, so I've just heard, you know, clips on YouTube over the years. And obviously Jackie as a personality was a big part of that show, but he was a writer and would feed stern lines and shit. And we would write for, you know, stuttering John and bits like that, that they did. Yeah. That wasn't Artie's role at all. Nah, he was more like a second voice. Like a, which like is a, like it's a so host. interesting. Yeah. It's so interesting. I think, and it tells you how much, uh, I do believe stern loved Artie at one time. Oh, you could see it in his face when he's talking to him, dude. He's like, I love talking to this guy. You can just see yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I think he loved and really appreciated Artie because he was willing to make Artie a second voice. Now, if you talk to um uh like Monique from Radio Gunk, um, I think something they talk about a lot is the there was like a popularity or a likability contest that they did with uh where the fans voted, and Artie was voted most likable on the show over Stern. And they say that's where things started to break down in their relationship. And Stern started to be resentful of Artie's role on the show. Um, but at a time you can tell he definitely like loved having Artie. And I think the biggest evidence of that is that Artie wasn't doing Jackie's job. Now, maybe based on the other candidates, um, maybe Howard had just made a, a decision in his mind. Like, I'm just going to change what that role is. Because the other guys that were up for it, you know, Corolla, um, I heard Artie reference, say like Bob Schimmel, uh, Robert Schimmel was kind of in the mix for that job. I remember hearing Rogan's name mentioned in that crew, Jim Florentine, Nick DiPaolo. Um, I don't think those, I think those guys would have been the same role as Artie as opposed to Jackie. Yeah. So maybe Stern in his mind just made up this guy's going to be the second voice. Um, but I do think Artie's role is completely different. And for someone like me, I like the Artie years of than the Jackie years. Oh, for sure. And again, that's because I'm listening to the Jackie years in hindsight where I was around for a lot of the artists. Yeah, but Artie's also got like the type of humor I highly enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't feel as a uh, schmaltzy as some of Jackie's stuff. Right. It's more r- real. Right. Um, anyways, uh, all that to say, that I think in the early years, um, while Artie was definitely doing stuff, I don't know how much heroin was involved. I think it was more coke based, mm-hmm. which not that that's great, but I think once heroin really started to uh, creep into Artie's life is where things really took a turn. What? What about him? What You're about him? talking too loud. You're waking him up. Oh, Artie, what's going on? No. Come on, pal. <laughs> You want to go lay down? I'm listening to. Do you want to lay down? No, I'm listening. I think he's sweating. He's falling asleep. What's going on today? You are sweating. I'm fine. All right. <laughs> I was listening to you talk about the uh, the guy in page six. Oh God. <laughs> Mike Walker. Mike Walker. Yeah. I love Mike. What is it, Fafa? Fa, you know, it's funny. During the commercial break, JD and I were standing there, and Artie closed his eyes. He was standing up, but he closed his eyes. I thought he was going to fall asleep on his yeah, feet. Yeah, he, he, I saw that. And JD pulls me outside. He goes, Artie's definitely falling asleep for that. Well, Artie went out and did this this charity benefit last night, and he's tired. And, and he's I apologize. Tired. No, but it's That's... Cupcake Wednesday, too. Yeah. Oh, and, and oh, my God. You should have seen how he attacked Listen that bagel. This no, but to that's me. not. Oh, that's, oh, I apologize oh, to you, oh, You're over there right. fighting sleep. Do me a favor. Put oh. your feet up and go to sleep. <laughs> no, just go to bed. Just leave the mic on so I can hear you snoring. So you would fall asleep on air. There were days. And, you know, Howard was great at making bits out of it and having fun with it and everything. Um, 
as a human being that probably wasn't, or as I should say, as an addict, that probably wasn't the best environment for Artie to be in. Mm -hmm. But from a content perspective, it was fucking gold. And that's the tug of war that went on in Artie Lang's life where he's like, Hey, even, even when I, when I'm a colossal fuck up, when I'm falling asleep at work or not showing up at all, when I'm faking, uh, calling out sick to do drugs, it's radio gold. So already was in a position where he really couldn't lose and yet was kind of, uh, throwing his career down the toilet at the same time. It's a weird dichotomy he was working with. Yeah, plus, I don't know if Stern knew yet that he was big, big into heroin. I think he truly probably thought he was tired from being up all night at the fucking benefit. <laughs> Stern, I think, purposely turned a blind eye to a lot of it. Right. Um, and I'm not even saying that in a bad way. I know uh, plenty of people have uh, villainized Stern over the years for various reasons. I think this is just what human beings do where there's only so much you can do. Like if you try and get already off of drugs, he's not going to listen. He's going to lie to you, blah, blah, blah. So there's only so much Howard really could have done. Now, should he have been more like, Hey, let's get you into rehab, things like that. Uh, sure. But I think Howard kind of looked at it and said like, you know, there's nothing I can do. The guy's an adult. He's going to fix himself. So I might as well get some great radio out of it. Right. Um, selfish probably, but also a, Pretty good broadcaster. <laughs> right, right. Uh, next we have Artie versus Teddy. This is this is probably the ugliest moment uh, in Artie's career, I would say. Um, because it seems like, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Teddy was Artie's assistant. And I, other than this, I don't know how much he was ever on air. I don't think he was a big character on Stern or anything. But uh, I guess Artie was very good to him and would like loan him money and things when he when he needed it. Um, and it's hard to tell because Artie's definitely fucked up during this uh, exchange. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to tell how much of this is real. But essentially, the accusation against Teddy is that he's being ungrateful to Artie. Um, and that Artie doesn't really appreciate it. Now, I think the backbone to a lot of it is uh, drug fueled, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, but the, it, it got to be over money. Um, there's an interesting thing. I didn't, I didn't pull clips from it, but, uh, he also went back and forth with dice over money. Um, I don't know if it was always drug related, but like money was a big deal with Artie. And in that clip with dice where he's arguing, he's going back and forth over money and Artie uh, gives exact amounts that he was owed. And uh, Dice goes, well, first of all, I didn't realize you said what you got paid on the radio, which is fucking psychotic, <laughs> 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 which is true. Like Artie was Artie was very obsessed um, with money and he would talk about uh, how much he got paid at gigs and things like that, uh, which is probably ill advised just from a, um, you know, a business perspective. Uh, but in this exchange, uh, it, it seems to be about the money, but I think there's a little more to it. You're always like, I'll give you money on Monday. Uh, and then I you heard. don't give me money on I Monday. I give you money all the time, you motherfucker. you wave $500 in front of me. I need that $500. All right, I so and then you always it. get it. You always get that money. And then I have to prod and poke you for it, and I hate doing that. <laughs> but Artie, not your paycheck. Because it's not your paycheck. You have to little... prod and poke me for money. But Daddy Artie. doesn't know. Artie. Artie. No bullshit. Half the paycheck isn't, isn't in the... Artie, I got to take on Virginia for one thing. How you're being wrong. Can I tell you why I'm right? You're coddling him because... No, I'm not. Because he's a Whatever, Artie. Hear my point of view. really fucked up, man. No, I hate you, Ted. Yeah. No, 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 Jesus Christ, you people are crazy. Oh, wait a second. Wow. I keep telling, why are you bringing this up? I don't know. Make it home. No, Artie, Artie, stop it. Jesus Christ. What the F is going on here? I've always found that ending baffling. Um, so first of all, based on Robin's reaction to things, if I was just listening to that, I'd be like, oh, this is fake. Right. It, it isn't. If you watch the video, it's very real. Um, and if you hear Artie's voice and everything, it's a peek inside what probably went on behind the scenes a lot. 
uh, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I'm not even saying on the Stern show. I just mean in his personal life. Yeah. yeah. But what stands out to me mo- more than anything, they're on Sirius at the time. Why does Robin say, what the F is going on here? I can, I've never been able to figure that out. Because they're still on E, weren't they? No. No, no, no. They were on uh, Howard TV. Oh, I have no clue. And they cursed all the time. They cursed in that clip. He says, give me my, that's not my fucking money, Ted. Oh yeah, that's right. It hits me. It hits me like uh, in Step Brothers when the mom's like, what the fucking fuck? I always hated it. <laughs> and that's, and, that's how I feel. I, sometimes I listen to the clip just to hear Robin because I'm so perplexed <laughs> by it. <laughs> but there's a, uh, I probably should have pulled this uh, part too. Um, but there, there's a moment where Artie comes back in to the room after that and quits. And it's kind of, it's like almost like a touching moment between him and Howard where uh, Artie says like, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not good. To, this, this place isn't good for me or whatever. Um, in hindsight, maybe that should have been Artie's last moment on the show. Assaulting an assistant. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, put it this way. At the very least, that's when Howard should have realized. Something's up. This was a legitimate problem. Right. Uh, but Howard brought him back. Um, and I, you know what? I think even Howard, the, the, the guy has a lot of flaws and he has a lot, there's a lot of hypocrisies in Howard Stern's career, mm-hmm. but I think even he has admitted like, listen, I wasn't an arty expert. I wanted to put on the best radio. And sometimes that, you know, that would cause him to neglect Artie as a human being. Um, so Artie comes back, uh, for about, Year and a half, maybe. I, th- I think this was uh, 2008, the Teddy incident. Mm-hmm. And I think he left at the very end of 2009. And he left uh, because of this incident that I think he's talking about with Opie and Jim, right? Uh, nope. Uh, we're at Pelican. Oh, sh- <laughs> yeah. We haven't gotten to the... I forgot. There's one more moment that people say, listen, I've been uh, kissing Howard's ass here for... Hey, you never know what people are feeling. But... Um, if you've wondered why we refer to, we did a Patreon episode that we referred to as the Pelican Brief. Uh, if you're wondering the origin of that, what's Howard Stern related? Why do they call it the Pelican Brief? What, what the hell does that mean? Uh, a lot of people said that this clip is the true falling out of Artie and Howard. And even Artie Lang says, this is the moment that Howard was done with me. It wasn't the drugs. It wasn't fighting a coworker. It wasn't anything like that. Um, Artie believes that this is when Howard was like, well, fuck this guy. I say, I say as my friend on the air, I go, can you believe this hot chick likes fat guys? I'll do my. Oh, sorry. I should give, uh, just to give a little context. Um, uh, some woman contacted the show and said she had like a, basically she was into Artie and Artie was his, Artie was her type. I think is essentially what it came down to. She said she was really into Artie and uh, he, he suited her, her needs, her yearning. Um, so Artie was, or so Howard was like, Hey Artie, we want to get you together with this, this woman. And Artie was a little insulted by that. Cause he took it as, Oh, this girl's into fat guys, so you're just gonna oh, it's funny, laugh at the fat guy getting pussy, I guess. So I already took offense to that. Um, and this is him voicing his displeasure with Howard. The gayest the fucking thing ever, bro. <laughs> the fuck says that. And uh, I do douchebag. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> is douchebag better? Yeah, and you wanna know something? I thought you were a bro. Honestly, I don't want to be a bro. I don't even know what the fuck that means. You know oh exactly what God. it means. A, a dear friend. Uh, you know Hold on one second. Artie never spoke to Howard like this. Never. This is like, this is a rare instance where, and again, who knows what, if Artie's uh, hung over or he's fucked up or whatever, which is causing him to kind of lash out like this. But no one was more respectful to, toward what they uh, what Howard Stern did for their career than Artie Lang. Um, so this is a rare instance for him to be like, thou oh, you fucking loser. <laughs> so he can't fuck take you. It. He can't fuck take you, you're not my fucking bro. Good. Fuck off. He'll keep Fred as a bro. It's That's right. Like that. Fuck off. <laughs> oh man. I mean it. I mean really. He's bro is insulting. A, a, bro, hey, you know what? I'll tell you what, man, in my day, because I grew up in the sixties, 
When you called somebody a bro and you fucking meant it, it meant something to people. Well, it's 2007. Uh, well, okay, bro. <laughs> so, uh, 2007, Mr. ACDC. Yeah. Bruce You're still living back in the fucking 80s. Fuck right, I'm in the 80s. Still in the 60s. It's still 20 years ahead. Uh, Everybody's I happen time to use traveling. that term a lot. And you know what? Well, I use it with my friend, Dr. Lou. And I use it for a, Listen, my friend Pat. What, and my, and my friend admitted. Pat calls me a bro. So let me tell you something. Here's what you're not I'll be admitting. sure not to call you a bro because you're not a bro. And I am admitting the truth here. I did it out of friendship. You're, you're not admitting that it's supp that it's segment radio. was supposed to make me look like a Wrong. fat guy. I will never admit that. Bullshit. And it's, it's, I would do it, the same for myself. It's embarrassing it's for me on the air, and laid. that's what's entertaining Dude, about it. you've got it 100% fucking okay, wrong fine. if you think that's my motivation in this. What if I strolled in a girl who's into geeky-looking, pelican-fucking I, I cared, fucking <laughs> I I cared about you. And, and the, she's got a fetish. She's into pelicans. Bring her in. <laughs> so and, uh, she's the whole segment is about the whole segment like is about this hot chick somehow liking an obese, disgusting fuck guy. Fuck off! You're a fucking asshole. <laughs> you're an asshole, and you better no, fucking you're see your psychiatrist. You know Go take another tab of that shit that keeps you off heroin. <laughs> I you need fucking can't I'm keep gonna need it today. <laughs> you're fucking. <ba> <laughs> yeah, you hear the two of them lash out at each other in a way they very rarely ever did. Um, and that's when Artie says the writing was on the wall for him. Howard had kind of written him off after that. Now, I just hearing that he says 2007. So I believe the Teddy incident happened after that. Um, so, I mean, if Howard really wanted him out, he could have used that as the excuse. So I don't know how true that is, but you can hear the, uh, Howard's very pissed in that moment. Yeah. But also I disagree with Artie. Um, again, I think this anger is fueled by various different things, but, uh, I disagree with Artie that like there was malice behind it. I like, yeah, maybe it makes good radio that you, you, they're going to make some fat jokes. So that contributes to good radio, but I don't think Howard was like, let's do this to humiliate Artie. I really don't believe that. I don't think so either. He's he'll, he'll find the funny in whatever. And right. Do it that way. Um, yeah. So you know, all, all of these factors led up to, Artie, uh, I believe his second book was called Crash and Burn, and it was based on this incident. This is him with uh, Opie and Jim talking about his suicide attempt. Yes. Are you, do you remember it at all? Well, I, it was never like a real state. It was like, it was like you know, I, I never, like I said, if I had abs, I'd be dead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I'm, I want you to live. Hilarious. No, it's, <laughs> if I had abs, I'd be dead. If I, if I were David Beckham, you'd be saying, oh, fuck. Boy, David was great. Uh, I couldn't get through the fat, you know? And it I'm was not like, hitting it. Uh, what it's the like, fuck? So it's like, if it's you, you'll, have, like, you'll have just a general oh, reaction. Funny. You'll have general reflex going, well, that hurts too much. <laughs> that hurts too much. And I was like, well, maybe here, here. I thought about the neck, but then I was like, uh, yeah. oh, listen, this is how dark it got. I thought about different ways to kill myself. I said, what if I just jump off an 80s story? I'll book myself at the Four Seasons. But I honestly said, what if I fall on somebody? Oh, I, I thought about that person and their family. Absolutely. I was being thoughtful. I said, could you imagine a woman on, like, Oprah Winfrey, and underneath it it says... Artie Lang fell on her son. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. He's one of 50 Artie Lang fell on her son and four of her. Her nephews. The whole family. <laughs> what did Norton say? 50 killed? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what that I didn't even think of it when I pulled it but that clip is a perfect encapsulation of Artie because he's talking about this horribly tragic thing and like he, he's literally talking about stabbing himself and if he were thinner he'd be dead and all this and he's making it hilarious yeah <laughs> so that's the, the the true brilliance of Artie Lang is that there's some real real darkness there and he was able to make it hilarious and to the point where you know, for 10 years on the Stern Show or eight, eight, nine years on the Stern Show, people didn't realize how dark it was. Like, that's how he that's how good he was at that. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, he, you know, he drank bleach and stabbed himself <laughs> and survived. Thank God. His um, I, I believe it was his sister and his mother. Um, they hadn't heard from him, so they went over to check on him. And luckily they found him in time. Um. And, you know, obviously uh, Artie lived through it, but uh, was not brought back to the Stern show. At that point, I guess Howard said um, the show's not good for him. And also he was becoming unreliable. Right. 
And there's even a clip right before uh, that contract ended um, because it coincided with Howard's contract being up at Sirius. Mm -hmm. And so there's a clip where Howard's talking to Artie and basically saying, like, I worry about you, too. I worry about where you're going to be in a year. Like, are you going to make it through this deal? And Artie's like, yeah, 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 I'll make it through. But you can hear Howard be like, you know, genuinely, is this guy going to be alive for the next year? So, you know, I think just as a, as a boss, Howard got sick of dealing with that from an employee, I guess. And, of course, that all, it also coincided with Howard starting to change as a guy and what he was doing with that show. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I, I, you know, I think after Artie left, there were like a couple years of Howard still being Howard somewhat. I'd say more 2013, 2014 was the real shift. But Artie being out of there was integral to that change. Because if Artie still, let's, let's say Artie, this is a fun uh, hypothetical. Let's say Artie sobers up for good after the suicide attempt and Howard brings him back. There's no way you would have to fire Artie without cause <laughs> to make it into the show it is now. Are like, you know, Robin and Fred and Gary and Ronnie, the limo driver and all these people, they'll go along for the ride. There's no chance Artie would watch the evolution of Howard Stern and have nothing to say about it. Right. You know, have no commentary on how different it is from a few years prior. Right. Um, so, uh, Artie's career went on after that. Um, you know, he was able to find his own way in radio and the first stop on that tour was the Nick and Artie show. Were you familiar at all? Uh, I, I never, I was, I was on direct TV, right? Yeah. I was on the audience network. And I think it was also on like Fox sports radio or something. Yeah. I wasn't big into this and I love both of them. <laughs> I remember hearing them on Fox sports radio. I don't know if they changed. Maybe they were just on audience. I'm not exactly sure, but I remember hearing I, in Western mass. That's all we had was uh, Fox sports radio for a while. Right. And so I was like, Oh fuck. Yeah. Like Nick and Artie are going to be on here. That's awesome. I don't think it was on there very long, No, but no, I they that. didn't last long at all. <laughs> I remember thinking it was pretty cool, but what I didn't realize is how contentious their work relationship was. Right. And I guess this kind of surprises me because Artie went to like the Connecticut school of broadcasting and, you know, was on the biggest radio show ever for a decade. Um, but I guess Nick was the guy that really steered the ship, so to speak. Um, and wanted to, you know, get to breaks on time and things like that. He was obsessed over it. Artie didn't give a fuck about it. So you'll hear a little taste of that in this clip. Take the Patriots. We're in the finals of the celebrity, celebrity series Indianapolis fantasy football. What Kansas other celebrities City. are in it? Nick, let me tell her one. <laughs> what? I'm telling her about that we're in the finals. I know. We got to do this because we got a musical guest and we got we got to teach all the right, twins. So, I got a job to do. I'm trying to do it, all right? You always all. fight like this. I'm trying to, yes, no, we do. We have a job No, to actually. Do. <laughs> it's a job. Okay, sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Jesus Christ. I've said three words tonight. All right, go ahead. Oh, my God. God. <laughs> I was Christ, just I'm just trying to do the picks. Okay. All, all right. We got a band. We got, they got to do another song. All right. We, you're going to teach the twins we don't have uh, to do that. a song, and then they're going to do the song at the end. We don't I've, have to do I've that. I've got it all thought out. We don't have to do the twins. Okay. We don't you have were to rehearsing do before the show. Yeah, but we could pl- do that after the break. Okay. After the uh, January uh, 7th. All right. Okay. Bonnie, where's your candle? <laughs> you want me to blow them up? <laughs> this takes two minutes. We can rip right through it, and we okay. can talk to Bonnie some more. That's what I was doing. Okay. We're, in the, we're in the finals right. of the Sirius Satellite. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for vacation. Give me a month. <laughs> it's it's weird to hear Nick DiPaolo be the one that's so intent on what sounds like hosting a Jerry Lewis telethon type show. They've got they've got musical acts and I know <laughs> sideshow freaks. I don't know what the hell is going on in that. It's just so like serious. Uh, no one gives a fuck who they're picking. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. And you know, um, I was about to say I don't know why it's so serious in this clip. The reason is I just don't think Artie and Nick worked well together. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they did each other's podcast after this. And th- 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 that's essentially what they I think they were just friends that never should have worked together, probably. Yeah. 
And I think uh, Nick's very regimented and wanted to get to certain things and had a plan in mind and had a schedule, whereas Artie uh, is a heroin addict. So <laughs> those two personality types don't necessarily mesh well. No, they don't. Um, so that didn't last very long. And then I guess... Uh, I was going to say surprising, but not really. My understanding is that Nick was a little more difficult to deal with from the um, uh, management side of things. That can't be And true. so it became the Artie Lang show. And that I don't think was a sports oriented. Nick and Artie was like a sports show. Yeah. And then it became more like what Artie's podcast was, where he would have comics on and shoot the shit, all that kind of thing. Um, and so this is a little, this is just a clip of him, him and Gilbert. Cause I realized as I was pulling clips, I didn't have any of him and Gilbert. Um, so this is him having Gilbert on the Artie Lang show and Gilbert, uh, pointing out some, some, you know, having some observations about Artie's, uh, I believe Artie was late to his uh, own radio show and Gilbert makes mention of it. We're back to the Artie Lang show. The great uh, Gilbert Gottfried's here. What's up, man? Yes. <laughs> Look at you. Let- what? what? How are I, you? What did I do wrong now? You did nothing. Wrong. Yeah. You look perfect. Yeah. <laughs> How are you, man? Yeah. La- last time I was here, after you begging me to come on, yeah. I came on and you weren't here. I had the flu. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll take that as an excuse. That's what I'm hoping. Yeah. I'll believe that. That's what I'm hoping. Yeah. Yeah. The flu. <laughs> yeah. Because it's funny because uh, you always took care of yourself. <laughs> so I can't understand how say, you would have the flu. A lot of people say to me, <laughs> yeah, Ar- sure. Artie, have you stopped drinking? I'm like, no, I Stop drinking in front of people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but now I'm back. I'm healthier. As you can see, I'm healthier than ever. Oh, yeah. You look terrific. <laughs> I saw, I saw Gilbert at a comedy club recently, and uh, uh, he met my girlfriend, who's 29 years old, very pretty, and he, the first thing he said to her was, are you dying of the AIDS virus? <laughs> <laughs> uh, those two together were amazing on Stern. Oh, yeah. I um, like the Gilbert Artie dynamic. And I've said this before, uh, probably when we talked, when we did the uh, Gilbert episode, that uh, they shared the same skill of being able to like stretch a joke out and make it last and do the old trick of beating it down so that it's not funny anymore. And then eventually it becomes funny again. Yeah. Uh, that's what these two were the best at where literally they could do, you know, a three hour show together and, you know, two and a half hours will be essentially, essentially be the same theme that they keep coming back to. Uh, like they, they, they they were uh, excellent together and I thought had, um, great chemistry, but, uh, uh, said we've, uh, half the guys we played no longer with us. Norm, Gilbert, Artie. Uh, oh, Artie's is still with us. I forget. <laughs> I was gonna say. I was gonna say. I was gonna. I was gonna save it for the end. I was like, this almost feels like a uh, uh, us jumping on a death episode. <laughs> well, well, I'm trying to time the algorithm right. Yeah, yeah. you know, likely we but- get it in now. We get a few views now, and then when Artie dies, we say, oh, he was a better man than he was a comedian, and he was one hell of a comedian. <laughs> Um, All right, what's next? Next, we have uh, him talking about the nose. Uh, oh, one one more thing I did want to say, because you hear Gilbert making jokes about, like, obviously, Artie's not in good health and things like that. Um, it does become tough, particularly for comics who are, you know, inherently just disorganized and they have their own problems and everything. Uh, I think it's easy, like, to sit in our seats and be like, uh, oh, well, if Gilbert knew there was something wrong with Artie, he should have done something. I think the amount of time people spent, it's like the Big J thing I mentioned earlier, the amount of pe- time people spent trying to get Artie help, it just eventually gets frustrating. Right. You know, people have their own lives they have to deal with. If someone's not accepting help at a certain point, you just have to be like, all right, well, you know, this is my friend. I can point it out so much, but there's only so much I can do, you know? Yeah, Exactly. Uh, so yeah, this is him talking about what happened to the nose. If you've, if you've seen him in recent years, the thing that stands out most is his nose. So this is, uh, I think he said it was a multitude of things that resulted in that, but this is probably the, the big one. 30 years of drug use, but this is one of the crazier stories. So there was this stripper I used to go on the road with 
and she would meet me in city. She was actually from Boston. She was from she was from Southie, and she was hot. But but when she like talked to her in sex, she sounded like Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> <laughs> that accent's so gross. <laughs> yeah, it is like it's the fuck grossest. me, you wicked hot fuck. You know. <laughs> but she was she was beautiful, and over the years, like I would meet her at hotels. She would call me on the road, and she was a drug addict. We used to start drugs together. So we're at a hotel in St. Louis. It's about, it's got about five years ago now. No, no, less three, four years ago. And um, we're snorting oxycote. So to, 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 to snort the pills, you got to crush them up. So we're in this hotel room, this nice hotel room. I got a show that night at a big theater. And um, uh, I go, I take a shower. She takes out like, like about, about five pills and starts crushing them. Now it was a nice hotel. So we had room service. The room service had a salt shaker that was glass. So she couldn't crush one of the pills. She takes, she takes the salt shaker and starts hitting the pill with it. And the salt shaker breaks glass breaks. (laughs) Okay. So then she takes a, a credit card and, and, you know, makes it into a fine powder, a fine dust, not knowing there's all glass in, in the powder. She cuts out like four lines. She gets called down to the desk to, to go to, I bought her a gift. So she goes down to get the gift. I come out of the, uh, out of the bathroom and I see the lines and I take a, I take a pen that I had cut down and I snort one of the lines and there's glass in it. I snorted glass and oxycodone. Holy shit. <laughs> Good God. Ugh. It's a weird story though. Cause I don't understand why would she chop it up in the lines? I don't get that part. Uh, it hits you different if you snore it rather than just take it. No, 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 <laughs> no! I know that. I get that. Oh, I <laughs> I'm saying if there's, did she not realize there was glass in it, even though she broke it? She broke it. I think she thought she got it out. Okay, all right. That's what I was asking. Yeah, uh, like the Craig's explaining to me drug use. I thought you meant why? like, why are they snorting it when they can just take I the pills? I don't understand. Are they injecting this heroin? What is that? What is that about? Uh, so that, yeah, I mean, gruesome. It really got. To where, and Artie would say, I think he said in this Rogan appearance, he goes, the one good thing about it is literally now I look in the mirror and can't avoid thinking of that. Like how my nose got to be that literally snorting glass. Right. Um, But then you hear rumors even up to a few months ago um, where like Artie has gone into disappearance and people think he's using again, things like that. So um he he really has had an addiction worse than anyone else that I can think of because everyone else who has it as bad as him dies. Yeah, exactly. That's the crazy thing about Artie Lang. He's just got a high tolerance. <laughs> and no one has this many stories because no one makes it to 60. Right. He's, he's fucking 55 years old now or whatever. He is. Maybe even older than that. Um. So he's just made it, uh, you know, he has all these stories because he's made it so much longer. Farley died when he was, what, 33? Belushi was 33 also, I think. Yeah. He's outlived them by over two decades. Yep. Yep. Uh, I was going to say, though, I think he's disappearing uh, is a good thing. I think he's trying to stay clean and he's doing well. That's that. Well, that's what other people say. Other people say that he is, he's trying to stay away from comedy clubs and things like that. With his gambling and his drug use, I wonder, like... Does he have enough money to just live out the rest of his life? I think he does. He was making like 145 grand a night. Oh, sure. I, I hope he does. And he should. But when you have addictions, expensive addictions like that, I just don't know. You know, it took an awful lot, a uh, long time to get to this point where I, <laughs> I look up the net worth. Um, oh, yeah, that's true. I don't know how accurate Artie's is going to be, but Ooh. I don't know if they factor in uh, cocaine. But oh, man. Uh, yeah, no, it's dropped. It's only at a million. Yeah, see? I don't know. Oof. At the peak, it was near 10, which that seems low, too. Yeah, I would have thought, I would have thought, well. Actually, he's gambling it all away. He's gambling it all away, but I mean, he was making 800. Uh, my understanding is he was making 800 grand a year on Stern. Damn. Um, and so that, you know, that's 10 years of that. And while he was on Stern, he's also doing, uh, you know, theaters every weekend. Yeah. In a month, he'll make his yearly salary. Um, he, he also did uh, the podcast. I thought his podcasts were good. Um, one, the Artie Quitter podcast he did in his house. 
And as he said many times, um, he did, I, I did a podcast in my living room and I was late 18 times. <laughs> um, but that was like a behind a paywall kind of the way Anthony Cumia does it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know how successful that was. I think he did fairly well with it. Um, particularly for that time, this is, you know, 2015, 2016 ish. Yeah. Um, so for that time, I think it was very successful. Um, but, uh, then he started doing, we just played a clip of him on Opie and Jim. He started doing these podcasts and, and shows that he never could because of his association with Stern prior. Um, now he started doing, uh, the Anthony Cumia show and they had some real chemistry and they started the AA show, the Artie and Anthony show on compound media. And this seemed like a can't miss idea. <laughs> oh, oh, did that seem great? It was great um, while it lasted. <laughs> it, it certainly was. That's where we are, by the way, right? Before yeah. I uh, this, is a, our, this is our last clip. Uh, oh, wow. We sped through them. Mm. Um, yeah. So uh, Artie and Anthony did a show together. When they were together, it was great. The problem was... <laughs> subscribers started to complain because a lot of people subscribed um, when Artie joined. And I think they were paying him a lot of money. Uh, But what happened was often uh, Artie would not be there or he'd be late. He'd miss the first hour of a two hour show very often. Yeah. And then, so then Anthony brought in Dave Landau as like a third mic Mm -hmm. Just to have someone to someone, talk to yeah, when Artie was an hour late or didn't right. show up at all. Right. Just by, by just in case, we mean when it happens this week, always. Yeah, almost, almost every day, pretty much mm-hmm. at a certain point. Right. And then it just got to a point where uh, Anthony was like, we're paying this guy a lot of money. It doesn't make any sense anymore. He's not doing the show. Um, so it doesn't, doesn't make any sense. I also think there was something in Artie's contract. Like if he doesn't make it through X number of months, then, uh, they don't have to pay him this certain thing. There was something I I've heard rumors about that. None of it confirmed. Um, but just, I mean, from a business perspective, it doesn't make any sense to pay a guy to not be there, you know? Right. Exactly. Um, and at that time, Artie also had crashing. He was on HBO. Um, that's the amazing thing is like he was able to be successful during all this. He was on a Judd Apatow uh, HBO show <laughs> while his life was uh, falling apart. So this is Anthony talking about some of the turmoil they went through on the Artie and Anthony show. It was literally nine months. It was nine months. So what year was it? It was a great nine months. The first few episodes were so good. And then watching the fall. Yeah. You'd be like, uh, spiral. Artie's a little late today. Yeah. Yeah. uh, So we're going to start without him. Uh, But everything's fine. And I was the battered wife saying, everything's good. No, don't (laughs) worry. Artie's fine. They were doing the show alone. He was at the hotel doing drugs all night. Uh, 40 feet from here. 40 feet from here. The hotel, which, by the way, won't allow us to pay for his room anymore because they walked in and blood was everywhere. (laughs) All over the bed, (laughs) the towels. They thought a murder had happened. So that (laughs) was... So, so I mean, what's true? What what's really sad about that is when Artie was there, their chemistry was magic. As a longtime Opie and Anthony listener, I would say the only person uh, that was ever close to doing the funny rip. Well, I shouldn't say that because Patrice yep. was great with Anthony, but in a very different way. Yep. But I'm saying just quickness of. Uh, firing away lines. Anthony and Norton uh, is one of my favorite combinations, but I think the only guy to come in and match what Norton would do with him was Artie. For sure. And I mean, we'll go back and listen to the Joe Matarese episode, folks. The best. Uh, the three of them together, it was, it was magic. <laughs> it was the best thing ever. Yeah, so that could have been something great. That's what's sad about it is Artie and Anthony could have been a, a great show. Um, but it just didn't, it just didn't work out. Artie was not at that place in his life. Then Artie comes back with another podcast, Artie Lang's halfway house. Um, he had Anthony on though. 
that's the thing is Anthony is totally cool with Artie. He's just like, as so many people in Artie's life have been, same with Nick DiPaolo, where he's like, I love Artie. But the problem is the guy, he just didn't show up for work. You know, can't rely on him. Well, that's a pretty, yeah, you can't rely on the guy. That's, that's a big problem. Huge. Um, you know who I got, who I got a lot of credit for trying to help Artie uh, during these times was Colin Quinn. Yes. Which I never would have really thought, but I guess Colin Quinn was constantly like, you know, eh, let's get into rehab, uh, whatever the <laughs> fuck, whatever the fuck he tried to do. But I guess he was, um, he was very, you know, he would reach out to Artie's mother and try to get him help, things like that. Um, and I get the uh, other story I've heard Anthony tell a lot is that like Anthony was kind of head in the clouds, like, oh, me and Artie are good together. We'll do a show together. No problem. And then Anthony always recounts that he was at the comedy cellar one night. And uh, David Tell walked by him and said, oh, Anthony, welcome to the wonderful world of Artie. (laughs) Are you ready for the 3 a.m. phone calls and lending him money and never knowing whether or not he's going to show up? (laughs) Like, Attell warned him right at the beginning, I guess. Yeah, yep. Yeah, a, a few people did. <laughs> but uh, Artie Lang's halfway house, I really enjoyed. Mm-hmm. And then one day, uh, it stopped. I think like I think Anthony is like the 25th episode of that show. And that was the last episode for like two or three years. Yeah. And then Artie Lang's halfway house disappeared. And what we started to hear was like, Artie's getting help. He's good. He's laying low. Um it stopped right before like the pandemic. Um, so I know one excuse that was given is like Artie's super nervous about uh, getting COVID and things like that with his health. Um, and so that went away for a while. Then about a year or so ago, it pops back up. Every once in a while, whoever controls Artie's account will tweet like, hey, I'm back. And people are like, yeah, Artie's back. And then that lasts like three months. And the guy's like, no, I mean me, the guy controlling his account, not Artie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, Jim is back is what I'm saying. <laughs> um, so Artie, pa- Artie Lang's halfway house returns. And this time it's done over Zoom. Uh, there's another guy kind of like controlling it who seems to be like Artie's handler or something. Uh, I wanted to include a clip. It's gone from the internet. I can't find it anywhere. Um, the one I wanted to include was already talking about Norm dying. Um, and I couldn't find it, which is sad. Interesting. Uh, so if anyone knows where that is, send it to me. But uh, I couldn't find it for whatever reason. Um, but if you go back and listen to those those episodes, the, the final edition of Artie Lang's Halfway House, He's just not the same guy. The life is sucked out of his voice. I don't know how to describe it, but I can tell you I've seen it in other people. Um, no, I think you like, described it perfectly. The life was sucked out of his voice is exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, like, I had a buddy, one of my very good friends in high school, had a very similar, you know, uh, story with drugs as Artie Lang. His thing was uh, Percocets. Yep. And this is when we were in high school. Uh, and he was like, you know, he's a pathological liar. He would rip people off, blah, blah, blah. Um, but like, he was a good kid. He was just a drug addict. And so he would kind of go through these fate where he would fuck people over and things and he would disappear. And so, um, similar to a lot of people in Artie's life, it got like too difficult to deal with him. And then, um, he, th- this kid hit me up one day when I was in college, I was at the uh, Westfield state. And he said he was in the area area and wanted to stop by. And I was like, oh boy. But I was like, yeah, sure. Let's get lunch or something. And we got lunch and he's telling me he's sober. And the sad thing was, I believe that he was sober. And that's sad because I was like, oh, that he's gone. He's not the same guy anymore. You know, the, li- mm. the, the life is sucked out of his voice. Just his voice is not the same anymore. Like nothing about him. Right. And that's what I heard when I was listening to those uh, final episodes of Artie Lang's Halfway House, like the 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 wit and the timing and the energy was just not there anymore, and it was like tough to listen to. Um, and then you know, and I don't even really want to go beyond that because everything else I've seen since then is purely fueled by like Reddit news. You know, right? People will speculate like, oh, he's back on drugs, or oh, he's living in Florida with his mother. Um, this and that. There's all kinds of stuff, but. Uh, I don't know is the real answer. And I imagine 
based on those episodes of Artie Lang's Halfway House, I imagine there is not another comeback in store for Artie. Um, or at least I kind of hope not, because I imagine it will be sadder than the last edition. I think so. I think you're correct there. Um, so I'm sorry if this was a if I bummed people out the way that I did this, <laughs> but but let's keep in mind we are celebrating uh, a great career, and honestly, one of the um, most inspirational triumphs of the human spirit, because like I said, this guy has lived through cocaine and heroin addiction. Longer than anyone in the history of mankind, I think. Yes. <laughs> Nothing has been able to take Artie down. It can't take him out. So it's very impressive. Um, and like I said, if you made it to this point in the podcast and you say, hey, there's plenty more you guys, you guys can talk about, you missed a bunch of stories, um, let me know what you want me to cover as far as Artie Lang. And uh, maybe we'll do a part two on the Patreon. And like I said earlier, if you're wondering, Mike, how do I find that Patreon? It's very simple. BlindMike.net. Um, subscribe and you get bonus episodes uh, a couple every single month. Um, so make sure you do that. If you like Why You Laughing and want more, you also get these episodes a week early if you're on the Patreon. Um, so a little more incentive as well as uh, the other nonsense that we do there, like Quincy and the Blind Mike Project. Um, and if you'd rather just support the show for free, leave us a five-star review on Apple, Spotify, uh, subscribe to the YouTube, get those YouTube numbers up because I think we might be monetized now. So hopefully we're making a few dollars off these episodes. Um, so go to the YouTube and subscribe and tap the notification bell. And uh, also, if you want to support the uh, Craigster and the work that Craig does, go to verygoodshow.org. Thank if you, you like Artie and you like shock jocks, that's the one. Go listen to Very Good Show. That's the one right there. Please and thank yes. you. Uh, all right, guys, we will talk to you next time on Why Are You Laughing? Zip it up and zip it out.